Welcome to the Serial Killer Podcast, the podcast dedicated to serial killers. Episode 131. And I am your Norwegian host, Thomas Rosaland Vyborg Thu. Welcome back to the fifth part of this ongoing series on the Killer Colonel. Last episode, I left you standing in the bedroom of Russell Williams's first murder victim, just as she had stopped twitching and laid still at his feet, him standing over her, watching excitedly. Tonight we come to the penultimate episode in this extensive expose of one of Canada's most recent serial killer cases. We continue Williams's travel into the very depths of human depravity and wickedness. As the judge said of good old Ted Bundy, extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile. Enjoy. Before we start the show proper, I want to, as always, publicly thank my elite TSK Producers Club. This club includes 22 dignified members of exquisite taste, and their names are Anne, Anthony, Captain Waters, Cassandra, Christy, Corbin, Evan, Fawn, James, Jennifer, Jesse, Kathy, Kylie, Lisa, Lisbeth, Mark, Mickey, Russell, Samira, Skortnia, William, and Zashia. You are the backbone of the Serial Killer podcast, and without you there would be no show. You have my deepest gratitude. Thank you. As always, if you want to donate to the show, you can easily do so at patreon.com slash the serial killer podcast. You can choose from many differing tiers ranging from one dollar to as much as you would like. Bonus episode access starts at ten dollars, while the TSK Producers Club start at fifteen dollars. Several bonus episodes are available. The latest two covering the expose of the Australian female version of Hannibal Lecter. So don't miss out and join now. Imagine, if you will, dear listener, being a military man who has found perhaps the love of your life, a woman whose interests and values match your own, and she is the most beautiful woman you have ever known. Your name is Paul Belanger, Camo's boyfriend, also in the military and stationed in Quebec. And it was you, Camo, had been chatting with when Williams was lurking and listening outside her house on Monday night. The two of you had arranged to have dinner Tuesday evening, and when she didn't show and didn't answer the phone, you decided to drive over to her house on Wednesday to find her silver-colored Toyota Yaris still parked in the driveway. Arriving at the house, you weren't particularly worried that anything was amiss, Perhaps you had done something to annoy her, and she was simply giving you a hard time for it. First you try her front door. There's no response. You're feeling more concerned now. This is not expected behavior of the woman you have learned to love. You quickly go around to the back, 
where you find the patio door unlocked. This too is unusual. Camo was not a woman who took her security lightly. You give a shout, get no response and decide to go inside. The house is dead silent. You shout her name a couple of times, but still no reply. You briskly walk up the stairs to her bedroom, the place where you have had so many loving moments together. The sight that greets you there is odd. Camo is lying in her bed, tucked in, looking almost peaceful. But she is very pale, and is that blood? You rush over to her and quickly realize you will never again feel her embrace or hear her voice. She has been murdered. Crime in Brighton is rare. So for the next several weeks, residents remained extremely uneasy, despite police reassurances that there was no cause for alarm over what looked to be a domestic-related incident. Williams's intrusion via the basement window had gone undetected by police, despite the blood traces in the walkway, and police found no other sign of forced entry. This suggested that Camo had known her killer and had led him into the house. For that reason, the boyfriend Belanger was of immediate interest to the detectives pursuing the murder investigation. They also learned from him that after the burglary on the 16th of November, Camo had noticed her belongings had been disturbed and that she had accused him of being the culprit. Not until Belanger passed a polygraph test, several days later, was he cleared. Then another possible suspect surfaced, a pilot at Eightwing who was put through two extremely distressing high-pressure interrogations before he was ruled out of the case. As police is interrogating suspects, Camo's house was torn apart in the search for evidence, from the floors to the ductwork to the insulated walls, requiring extensive repairs when the police were done. The best clue they had was the blooded footwear impressions Williams had left behind in the outside walkway. He subsequently discarded the running shoes he'd been wearing. But of course there was nothing to compare them to. And the same was true of the DNA traces Williams left in Camo's bathroom sink where he had washed his hands. The killer colonel, meanwhile, once again resumed his normal life. As Williams would later tell police, on the Tuesday morning, a few hours after murdering Camo, he drove from his cottage in Tweed to Gatineau, across the river from Ottawa, where he participated in an 8.30 a.m. meeting regarding the recently acquired C-17 Globemasters. He remembered the meeting, he said, because the big aircraft, a vital component of the Afghanistan war effort, had been so much a part of his job when he'd been working in Ottawa at the Directorate of Air Requirements a couple of years earlier. It was very foggy on the morning he made the drive, he also recalled. The meeting wrapped up mid-afternoon, and later he had dinner at a restaurant with his wife, kissing her goodbye and then heading back to Tweed. But in an odd memory lapse, he was unable to tell Detective Sergeant Jim Smith where the couple had dinner, even when pressed, except to say that it was somewhere in Westboro, the upscale Ottawa neighborhood where their new house was being built, now nearing completion. Nor could he remember who paid for the meal, only that it would have been paid with MasterCard. On the 25th of November, the same day Kumo's battered and bloodied body was discovered in her home, Williams took part in a charity stunt that in hindsight can only be described as grotesque. As the eight-wing commander usually did, he lent his weight to Trenton's annual United Way fundraiser. In a corny but effective attention-getter known as Jail and Bail, organized at numerous workplaces across Canada, 
Bosses and celebrities get rounded up and quote-unquote arrested on absurd charges, sometimes by good-humoured cops. From a mock jail, the prisoners then frantically appeal to friends and colleagues to bail them out, and the money goes to charity. Williams cheerfully pitched in. He was arrested on a charge of being too young to be a wing commander. He was 46, while Lieutenant Colonel Sean Lewis, Eight Wings Logistics and Engineering Officer, was accused of having a full-length mirror in his office and looking at it too often. Under the caption, Jail and Bail Event Locks Up the Worst Wing Offenders, the December 4 edition of Eight Wings Weekly Newspaper carried a picture of Williams grinning into the camera, his hands tied behind his back. The next time he would pose for police photographs, he would not be smiling at all. Camo's funeral was held on the 4th of December at the National Military Cemetery in Ottawa. Hundreds of friends, family and military personnel were there, including both Alan Plant, her former long-time boyfriend, and Paul Belanger, her boyfriend that had discovered her body. Padre Paul Alain Monpa delivered the eulogy, lauding the murdered soldier's accomplishments, her great sense of adventure, and her integrity and devotion to duty. Colonel Russell Williams did not attend the funeral service. Padre Paul Alain Monpa said in his eulogy, and I quote, Marie's respect for those around her aided her career in the military. She always found the words for those having difficulty. She was never scared to get involved. She was full of talent, and whoever knew her can say she made a difference in their lives. Marie, a ray of sunshine to her friends and family, embarked on a lifelong quest to seek truth in her life. She lived her life to the fullest. End quote. Even though he did not attend her funeral, Williams had brazenly made a contribution too. Earlier in the week, he had written to Kumo's father on his official letterhead, expressing his condolences on behalf of the Eight Wing Base. The letter read in part, again I quote, Please let me know whether there is anything I can do to help you during this very difficult time. You and your family are in our thoughts and prayers. With our deepest sympathy, Colonel Russell Williams. End quote. On the 6th of December, Williams and Harriman took possession of their new house in Ottawa. They had already sold the home on Wilkie Drive in Orleans, where they had lived for 14 years, and now they were relocating to Westboro, an established upscale neighborhood a few minutes' drive from the city centre. Former neighbours on Wilkie Drive say the upkeep on the old house had become too time-consuming for the couple and their busy schedules. But the move also shortened the commute for Harriman, whose offices were situated in a downtown high-rise office tower. Most of the homes on Edison Avenue have been there for many years, but like the property next door, number 473 was brand new, purchased from the Prestwick Building Corporation for 693,819 Canadian dollars. Williams and Harriman got a three-story, three-bedroom townhouse comprising 2,200 square feet. As often happens with new houses, completion ran a bit behind schedule, so Harriman had stayed with friends for a few weeks after selling the Orleans property, while Williams had lived in Tweed. On the 15th of December, Williams welcomed the Olympic torch when it stopped at Trenton, en route to the Olympic Games in Vancouver. In all, 14 military bases took part in the ritual. It's very exciting to be a part of this, he said. In the 18th of December issue of Contact, his Christmas message to the men and women under his command urged them to, and I quote, 
reflect upon our collective accomplishments and to look forward to the future. He and Chief Warrant Officer Kevin West listed some of Eight Wing's achievements for the air. I quote, We have maintained the support lifeline to our mission in Afghanistan, saved fellow Canadians through search and rescue operations, conducted all aspects of air mobility support, whether VIP or material support, and returned to Canada our fallen soldiers with honor and dignity. End quote. With the approach of Christmas, Williams concluded, and I quote, We know that many of you will be thinking of our comrades serving elsewhere, away from their loved ones. We thank you for the support we know you will provide their families here at home. End quote. Christmas came and went, then New Year's Eve, which Williams marked by attending two parties at the Eight Wing Officers' Mess, a formal dress kit function followed by a more relaxed get-together with some of the civilians attached to the base. He stayed for a drink and then departed. The 3rd of January saw one of the largest ever repatriation ceremonies to stem from the Afghan conflict. In a biting wind, Williams watched as the coffins of Sergeant George Miok, Sergeant Kirk Taylor, Private Garrett Chidley, all from the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, and Corporal Zachary McCormack, a reservist with the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, were unloaded. And there was a fifth coffin, that of award-winning journalist Michelle Lang, seconded to the Canadian press from the Calgary Herald and reporting from the Kandahar area for less than three weeks before she was killed. Lang had been travelling with other soldiers when the vehicle they were in was ripped apart by a roadside bomb. Williams performed his official duties in the repatriation ceremonies impeccably. It was business as usual for him. Snow lay on the ground, and the raw February wind whipped across the surrounding farmland as the police cruisers moved into position blocking the two-lane highway in each direction. A checkpoint was being set up, with cars from two police forces, the Belleville Police Service and the Ontario Provincial Police. Behind the wheel of one of the OPP cars that pulled up was Constable Russell Alexander, a career officer from the small Maddock detachment who was nearing retirement. He stepped out onto the asphalt. It was this same constable who in late October had suspected Larry Jones, Williams's next-door neighbour, of being responsible for the twin home invasion sexual assaults on and near Cozy Cove Lane, and his presence at the roadblock may have been a coincidence. But what was rapidly becoming clear in the fast-widening investigation was that those two attacks were almost certainly linked to the recent mysterious disappearance of a popular young Belleville woman, and that the unsolved murder of Corporal Marie-France Camo two months earlier in Brighton was probably part of the picture too. This was an early Thursday evening, the 4th of February, 2010, around 7 o'clock, and the checkpoint on Belleville's northern outskirts where Highway 37 stretches toward the sleepy village of Tweed, was what's termed a rolling roadblock. Mobile and set up without warning, rolling roadblocks are routinely deployed in rural Ontario to nab drinking drivers and, increasingly, under toughened provincial legislation, speeders. And at first glance, that would have seemed to be the purpose of this one, which in part it was. As a trickle of motorists slowed down and obligingly rolled down their windows, the first question was friendly and remarkable. Good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Any alcohol tonight? This evening, however, something more than drunken drivers was on the minds of the cops, whose roadblock remained in place through the night, 
until almost six the next morning, long after Belleville's bars had closed for the night. One week earlier, almost to the hour, a vivacious independent-minded woman of twenty-seven had inexplicably vanished overnight from the brick-and-siding bungalow where she lived alone, right where the police checkpoint now straddled Highway 37. So as the passing motorists pulled up and the police discreetly sniffed for a whiff of booze, drivers were asked to cast their minds back a few days. Had they been travelling this way the previous Thursday evening, the 28th of January, or early on Friday? Did they recall seeing anything unusual? Did they know of anyone else who did? Jessica Elizabeth Lloyd was born in Ottawa, where her father, Warren Lloyd, spent more than 25 years at CFB Ottawa in the Canadian Navy's communications section. On retiring in 1990, when Jessica was eight, Warren Lloyd and his small family relocated to Belleville. Home was the Red Brick Bungalow on Highway 37, which was built for her parents and which later became Jessica's property after her father died of cancer and her mother moved into a smaller place in Belleville. At the time of her death, Jessica had owned the house for less than nine months. After graduating from Quint Secondary School in 2000, she attended Belleville's Loyalist College, graduating after three years with a diploma in Business Administration and Human Resources. After a couple of interim jobs, she was hired by Tri-Board Student Transportation Services in Napanee, where she worked as a transit planner. She was famously reliable, which was the reason the alarm was sounded so early when she didn't show up for work that Friday morning. From the first hours of Jessica Lloyd's vanishing, alarm bells rang. She'd texted a friend shortly after 10.30 at night to say she'd arrived home safely after spending the evening with him at a mutual friend's house and was turning in for the night but she'd failed to show up for work the next morning at the bus company where she'd worked for the past two years. And because she was always punctual, colleagues at work swiftly realized something was very wrong. The 29th of January was a Friday, and at around nine o'clock, Lloyd's mother, Roxanne McGarvey, got a call from the school bus company in Napanee, telling her that her daughter had not shown up for work that morning. McGarvey headed for Jessica's house, stopping off en route at the office of Jessica's doctor in Belleville to see if, by any chance, she was there. On arriving at her daughter's house, she found the car still in the driveway, the doors locked, and no signs of a break and enter. Inside was everything Jessica would normally have had with her, her purse and identification, her blackberry, her eyeglasses, her keys. Margarvey began phoning family members and friends, and Jessica's older brother Andy, to whom she was very close, was among the first to get the call. He had rushed over to his sister's house, and soon police and volunteers had shown up en masse. The police arrived shortly after noon, and quickly spotted two sets of footprints in the snow, leading from the house to a set of tire tracks about 150 yards away, on the edge of the cornfield at the north end of the property. Scores of volunteers began fanning out and scouring the woods and surrounding fields, and they were joined by personnel from CFB Trenton, together with police from Belleville and from the small neighboring Sterling Rawdon Police Department. The OPP brought in a helicopter as did the military at Eight Wing, a big yellow search-and-rescue cormorant, the deployment of which was approved by the base commander, Colonel Russell Williams. Hundreds of posters were quickly printed and distributed. Plastered on cars and hydro poles, 
seeking a beautiful young woman who was five foot five, weighing 125 pounds, with bright green eyes, brown shoulder length hair, and an intricate L shaped tattoo across her lower back. There was widespread concern about the disappearance, as Lloyd had lived most of her life in Belleville and was extremely well liked. An ad hoc Facebook group, Find Jessica Elizabeth Lloyd, sprang to life as more than 48,000 people, including family and friends, but mostly strangers, pitched in with sympathy, thoughts, and advice. Deputy Belleville Police Chief Paul Vandergraaff called the collective response amazing. Despite the massive attention from the public and law enforcement, however, a week after Lloyd had disappeared without a trace, there had been no breakthrough nor any sign of one. And the sense of foreboding that built with the passing days soared on Wednesday, the 3rd of February, when Belleville police issued a stark warning to the city's women, especially those living alone. Keep your doors locked, vary your daily routine, try to be with friends, report anything or anyone suspicious. There was good reason for the police alert, because, sinister as Lloyd's disappearance was, the larger picture police were by now looking at was becoming more threatening as they joined up dots from the past four and a half months. The two bizarre sex attacks in Tweed, the murder in Brighton of Corporal Marie France Como, and now what looked to be the abduction of Lloyd in Belleville. Different types of crimes, in different places, under scrutiny by different police. Still absent from the mix was any connection to the dozens of lingerie break-ins in either Tweed, all of but one which had gone unreported, or Ottawa, more than 125 miles away. Nonetheless, the ingredients were in place for what could have been a reprise of the cross-jurisdictional chaos that hampered the Paul Bernardo murder investigation in the early 1990s, which was badly marred by interdepartmental police rivalry in Toronto and Niagara region. And here, dear listener, I must ask you to pause briefly. The Homolka Bernardo serial killer case is extremely interesting, and a case that will be featured on the Serial Killer podcast in the future, rest assured. There were, in other words, police officers on this case that remembered the utter horror that those two killers inflicted upon Canada only a short decade earlier very well. They hoped they would be able to stop a repeat tour of hell this time around. One of the advanced tools the police had at their disposal was what is termed the VICLASS computer system. It's an acronym for Violent Crime Linkage System, part of a national network that's mostly run by the Royal Mounted Canadian Police. VICLASS grew out of a still earlier investigation in the 1980s involving British Columbia serial killer Clifford Olson, and its broad function is to track and analyze common threads in seemingly disparate investigations. All Clifford was a convicted Canadian serial killer who confessed to murdering 11 children and young adults between the ages of 9 and 18 years in the early 1980s. He was a pure-blooded psychopath, and, as with all other serial killers, he too will have his day in the limelight here on this show at a later date. A highly specific vehicle canvas was undertaken by police. Along with the tire tracks discovered on the far northern edge of Lloyd's property, there had been two separate sightings of what looked like an SUV parked there on the night she vanished. Its make was unknown, 
but using the tire tracks, identification specialists were able to measure the width between its wheels. Those two bits of information were fed through a provincial government database, and roughly 450 vehicles that might be the suspect one showed up. They included, but were not limited to, Toyota 4Runners, 1996-2002, Jeep Cherokees, 1999-2004, and Nissan Pathfinders, 1998-1999. Of those 450 SUVs, police had traced 178 and were still in the process of interviewing the owners when the roadblock was set up on Highway 37 on that chilly 4th of February evening. So, Constable Alexander and his partners were carrying a tape measure and photos of the tire tread marks. OPP forensic specialists had photographed the tread, magnified the image and pasted it onto a sheet of cardboard, along with an estimate of the wheel width. And now came what proved to be the moment of truth. The roadblock was set up shortly before seven o'clock, and one of the very first vehicles to pull up within a minute or two was a 2001 silver-colored Nissan Pathfinder piloted by none other than the Air Force Colonel who commanded the eight-wing military base in Trenton. Still in his crisp blue uniform, he was heading toward his home in Tweed and was in a hurry he explained. He appeared arrogant, aloof, and tried to pull rank, as the term goes. This would prove to be one of his most damning mistakes, and contributed to his ultimate fate later on. The police officer at the roadblock looked at William's pathfinder, measured the width between its wheels, and concluded that there wasn't an exact match with the mysterious SUV. But the Pathfinder's Toyo Open Country HT tires were a different story. Particularly notable was the front left tire, which appeared to closely resemble one of the telltale tracks. The officer said nothing of this to Williams, filled out his questionnaire, and with a nod and a wave, the colonel was soon on his way up Highway 37, heading toward his lakeside hideaway on Cozy Cove Lane. But back at the roadblock, an animated discussion was taking place about whether to pull the alarm cord and place surveillance on the colonel. The police officer knew who Williams was. He was a distinguished guy, the boss of Eight Wing, and he made the case that, even though his tires seemed to match the tracks, it was probably a coincidence. If anyone would be above suspicion, it surely must be Colonel Williams. One of the Belleville officers vigorously disagreed, and after an argument, the first officer relented. So, as Williams drove up the highway, an internal police call was made. Surveillance, the officer was saying, now, right now. Let us wind back a few days. Once again, we are back at the Lloyd House, Thursday, the 28th of January. Jessica was not at home, which suited Williams perfectly. He staked out the house, located the various entry points he would be able to use to complete his plans, and then left. He drove back to his cottage. It wasn't very far away and changed into his attack clothes, and packed up his rape kit. Then he headed back down the highway toward Belleville and Lloyd's house, leaving his Blackberry phone behind. This time, Jessica was at home. Williams parked his Pathfinder on the far northeast end of the property and walked around the edge of the field to observe the surroundings and scope out his attack route. Jessica had returned home, Around 10.15 p.m., 10.36, she sent a text message to her friend Dorian O'Brien, telling him she was safely home. 
the text message was to be the last anyone other than Russell Williams got of any signs of life from Jessica Lloyd. Jessica was at sleep in her bed when Williams entered her house, this time through the patio door. The precise timing of this entry is unclear, but the photos Williams took were time-stamped at 1.19 a.m. on the 29th of January, suggesting he entered around 1 a.m. As with Jane Doe and Laurie Massicott, he had intended to strike or seize Jessica while she slept, but she awoke as he stood over her. He ordered her to lie on her stomach. Then he tied her hands behind her back with a rope from his rape kit. Duct tape, dear listener, seems to be a recurring tool for serial killers, both in real life and in the movies. It was no different for Williams, and he once again turned to the ever-practical product in order to blindfold Jessica with it. The next three hours he orchestrated another horrific photo session. He took scores of still photos and recorded lengthy videos in which he made sure the lighting was to his liking by expertly arranging the various table lamps. As with his previous victim, Jessica was sexually assaulted and raped repeatedly. She was stripped naked and forced to pose in lewd pornographic poses. He raped her, vaginally and anally, and made sure not to climax, in order to make everything last as long as possible. At one point, when she was trying to fight him, he calmly told her, and I quote, You want to survive this, don't you? When she replied with a hoarse, Yes, he nodded and told her she was doing good. Later on in the session, He recorded how he forced her to perform oral sex on him while placing a zip tie around her neck. As she put his penis in her mouth, he told her, and again I quote, If I feel anything I don't like, I pull on this zip tie and you die. Got it? End quote. Jessica showed extraordinary courage in the face of such a cold, calculating, and extremely brutal killer. Instead of panicking, and thus risking him killing her outright, she tried to placate Williams by trying to do exactly as he wanted. As Williams was torturing and raping Jessica, his SUV was spotted in the cornfield by local handyman Lyle Barker, who thought it looked out of place. Later on, When the case blew up and was all over the news, he contacted police about it. It would prove a vital tip in the case. After three hours, time that must have felt like an eternity, Williams forced Jessica to walk with him across the field to his truck. She was still blindfolded, and her hands were tied behind her back. It was the dead of night, just before early morning, around 4.30 a.m., and he drove his victim back to his empty cottage in Tweed. An hour or so after arriving, he forced her to take a shower with him, which he of course photographed and videotaped. He later told police he had allowed her to sleep for a few hours while he dispatched an early morning message to Eightwing that he had the stomach flu and would not be able to make the luncheon in the officer's mess at eleven. When Jessica awoke, and at some point soon after, she experienced what appears in the video to be a seizure. Later, when the admitted facts of the case were entered as evidence, it was suggested by a relative of Lloyd's who attended the court hearing that she had no history of seizures, and that this one may have been a desperate ruse designed to induce Williams to take her to a hospital, as she repeatedly implored him to do. Something she said, captured on video, suggests it was indeed a trick. I quote, 
We have to go to the hospital because I only have 20 minutes from the time it starts. End quote. Jessica tells Williams this as if seizures were something she was familiar with. What is clear is that she was in enormous torment, and Williams again displays the same macabre quasi-compassion he had shown during the two sex attacks in Tweed, alternating between merciless cruelty and what in another context would be construed as concern. What can I do to help you? Relax, Jessica. Don't bite your tongue, he says at one point. All the while he kept taking more photographs and video. And as he did so, she was crying, begging him to dress her and take her to the hospital. Near the end of that segment of the video footage, as he is pulling a sweater over her head, she is still weeping. In the video she says, and I quote, If I die, will you make sure my mom knows that I love her? She continues to cry, and Williams says nothing. And then he turns off the camera. He pulled some clothes on her and allowed her to sleep some more on the floor. He shot video of that too. She awoke at around one o'clock in the afternoon, and Williams told her he was going to set her free but that he first wanted to take some more pictures of her modeling her underwear, which he had brought with them from her house in Belleville. He used a zip tie again for the same purpose as before, and he once again raped her, gazing calmly into the video camera as he did so. After several more hours of degrading sexual assault and rape, Williams dressed Lloyd in her blue jeans and a hooded roots sweatshirt, gave her some fruit to eat, and told her once again that she was going to survive. And perhaps she believed him, because in one of the most chilling moments of the video, she appears sitting up on the bed, still blindfolded with the duct tape, and with her hands still roped behind her back, but with a broad smile on her face. At around 8.15 that evening, still tied up, and now with duct tape over her mouth as well as her eyes, so that she had to breathe through her nose, Lloyd was led toward the door of the cottage. As she walked through the living room, Williams clubbed her from behind with the same heavy red flashlight he had used in his earlier attacks on the other women, cracking her skull and probably knocking her unconscious. He then strangled her with a piece of rope. He told police it was the only time he hit Lloyd during her almost 24-hour ordeal, and that before he did so, he had spent some hours pondering how to murder his prisoner. But it was not the blow that killed her. The cause of death was strangulation, the autopsy found. As she lay on the floor of his cottage, blood pooling around her head, Williams took three more photographs. He carried Lloyd's body out to the garage and cleaned up some of the blood in the living room. Then, somewhere between nine and ten that evening, he got into his Pathfinder and drove back down Highway 37 to the Eight-Wing Base in Trenton, where he spent the night ready to get back to business as usual. And with that, Colonel Williams' second act of murder that we know of, this episode and part five in this saga covering Russell Williams comes to a close. I hope you enjoyed listening to me telling it to you. The next episode, number 132 in number, will be the final installment in this expose. So as they say in the land of radio, stay tuned. Finally, I wish to thank you, dear listener, for listening. If you like this podcast, you can support it by donating on patreon.com slash theserialkillerpodcast. 
by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, facebook.com slash the SK podcast, or by posting on the subreddit, the SK podcast. Thank you. Good night and good luck. Thank you.